Welcome uh, everybody. I'm um, Massimo Tommasoli. I'm the permanent observer for international idea to the United Nations. And um, I'm talking today as the coordinator of the SDG 16 data initiative for 2021. Uh, the SDG uh, 16 data initiative uh, is the organizer of today's event on measuring progress on SDG 16 and the impact of the pandemic in achieving peaceful, just and inclusive societies. Uh, I uh, have, first of all, to say that today's meeting, um, today's virtual event uh, is being recorded. So uh, we are uh, on the record. Please uh, take that into account uh, when you uh, take the floor. Um, a couple of uh, initial uh, announcements. Uh, once uh, you join the meeting, please uh, make sure that you mute uh, your mics. And, um, and also that you switch off your uh, cameras uh, until in case you are given the floor. Uh, this will be an interactive uh, session. We have um, uh, a number of panelists, but we'll try to have uh, also a possibility of questions and answers. The questions um, will be posed uh, via the chat. Uh, so please send uh, questions uh, uh, using the chat function to everyone. And then uh, during the session, uh, the interactive session, uh, we'll make sure that your questions will be addressed uh, to the panel. Uh, in that case, uh, uh, please also indicate your name and affiliations when you post uh, a question. So uh, just a few words of um, introduction. Um, if I may situate today's meeting, in uh, uh, the perspective of uh, broader 2030 agenda, uh, I uh, cannot uh, uh, avoid talking about the SDG 16 data conference that is starting tomorrow, organized by uh, the UN uh, Department of Economic and Social Affairs by uh, the International Development Law Organization and the government of Italy. Uh, today's event uh, is aiming also at contributing to the conversation that will take place in the next days uh, in the context of the SDG 16 conference. And it's in a way also a follow-up to another side event that we organized um, during the first SDG 16 uh, conference in Rome in May uh, 2019. Um, Everything happened since there. Many things changed. We all know about uh, the challenges that the pandemic has posed uh, to the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. And today we'll focus in particular on the SDG 16, but um, by zooming into uh, the uh, goal that deals with peace, justice and uh, accountable institutions, uh, we will also take into account the implications for the implementation of the agenda as a whole. If you uh, consider the efforts at the national level that aim at building back better, as the Secretary General of the United Nations said, uh, it is uh, very important to take into account these three elements. Um, peace, access to justice and the quality of institutions. The SDG 16 Data Initiative is a consortium of 17 organizations dedicated to the implementation and open tracking of progress towards the uh, targets included in SDG 16. And the main aim of this initiative uh, is to uh, integrate official indicators with non-official indicators. The official indicators that have been approved uh, by uh, governments uh, at the UN Statistical Commission and which have also guardians in the UN system in order to collect and systematize uh, information at the global and regional level. Uh, they need integration uh, with the non-official data and these data uh, are provided by a wide range of non-state uh, uh, international organization and other actors. The uh, consortium uh, pulls together uh, these actors and uh, produces a, uh, first of all, a 
an online database with data uh, and that is accessible to the public and also a global report that is annually produced. The last report uh, was produced uh, last year, uh, but data uh, referred mainly to uh, 2019. So at that time, uh, the impact of the pandemic uh, was in its in each initial stages of analysis. And many uh, things have happened since then. One of the main issues uh, has been in our perspective, uh, how to um, address the impact of uh, pandemic on uh, inclusion of uh, perception and other indicators uh, that are not included in the official indicators uh, in order to uh, monitor uh, progress on the implementation of the agenda. And clearly the pandemic has had a major impact also in terms of data collection and analysis uh, including for official indicators. So I think that this will be one of the underlying themes of today's conversation. We have a panel uh, composed of some uh, representatives of some of the uh, institutions that compose our com consortium. I will briefly introduce uh, each of the panelists before uh, they speak. The first uh, uh, panelist is uh, Sara Chamnes Long, director uh, access to Justice Research or the World Justice Project. Uh, she will uh, uh, focus in particular on uh, the target 16.3, among other things. Sarah, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, just give me one moment while I share my presentation. All right, so um, as Massimo mentioned, um, I'll be talking today about progress on SDG 16.3 on rule of law and access to justice. So I'll be um, talking about um, addressing many of the, the themes and, and guiding questions of this panel um, in two main sections of this presentation. So one will be um, focused on why rule of law and access to justice matter right now, and that will be um, anchored in data insights from our rule of law index and our global legal needs survey. And then I'll turn to um, broader data challenges and opportunities on SDG 16.3. So why do rule of law and access to justice matter right now? So the first insights I'll be sharing come from WJP's Rule of Law Index 2020. Um, this is a quantitative assessment tool designed to measure adherence to the rule of law in practice. It covers 128 countries, um, and the scores in the index come from primary data um, collected from household surveys via our general population pool and surveys to experts in civil and criminal law, labor law, and public health. Um, so through all of these surveys, we collect data on more than 500 question level variables that are used to construct the scores that I'll be speaking about now. Um, and just a note that our Rule of Law Index 2020 was published um, right before the beginning of the pandemic, um, but nonetheless, I'll be talking about some key trends that are really relevant to the current moment and that we'll want to monitor as um, the next iteration of our index is released and also in the coming years as countries grapple with, with recovery from the pandemic. So in this first slide, um, this looks at um, countries' performance over the course of the last year. So it kind of plots them out according to whether they perform above or below the median rule of law index score and whether their performance has improved or declined in the last year. And we can see here that more countries' rule of law index score has declined in the last year than improved. So 55 countries saw a decline, 44 saw an improvement, and the remainder were unchanged. Um, and this is a consistent trend that we've now seen for three years in a row. Um, and this trend holds for developed democracies as well as less free states. So when we delve a little bit deeper into what is driving this decline, we can look at the eight primary dimensions or factors of our rule of law index, which are constraints on government powers, absence of corruption, open government, fundamental rights, order and security, regulatory enforcement, civil justice, and criminal justice. And here we can see the percentage of countries that have seen an improvement um, or a decline in each factor over the last year and over the last five years. 
And what's striking here is that we see persistent declines over time in the areas of constraints on government powers, absence of corruption, and fundamental rights. And these are areas that are particularly susceptible to erosion during emergencies. So this is an important trend to keep an eye on in the coming years. And very importantly, rule of law matters for public health. So we see a strong correlation between our rule of law index scores and a number of health outcomes, including maternal mortality, infant mortality, life expectancy, and chronic disease. So what we see here on the left is that as um, countries' rule of law index score increases, um, chronic disease mortality rate falls. And on the right-hand side, as countries' rule of law index score increases, life expectancy also increases. And it's important to know that this trend holds even if we control for countries' GDP level of spending on health and Gini coefficient. So what this tells us is that rule of law is really important for the functioning of institutions and their ability to translate expenditure and other resources into outcomes that improve the lives of people. Next, I'm going to talk about just a few data insights from our Global Legal Needs Survey. So this was a household survey um, administered to more than 100,000 households in 101 countries between 2017 and 2018. The data from this sur survey are captured in a report called Global Insights on Access to Justice that highlights the most common justice problems in countries, um, resolution processes, and outcomes. And the survey instrument used to collect this data um, provided the methodological basis for the 16.3.3 indicator on access to civil justice that was just adopted by the UN Statistics Commission about a year ago. So one important finding from this data is on uh, some of the most um, common justice problems. Um, and preliminary evidence um, and reporting from legal service providers, um, surveys to justice experts, among others, are showing that many of the most common justice problems prior to the pandemic are on the rise. So here we have a set of 20 randomly selected countries from our survey and the incidence of 12 broad categories of justice problems. And we see that um, family disputes, housing disputes, problems related to money and debt, and problems accessing public services um, were very common. And um, we already know that these are on the rise, so it will be important to um, pay attention to these in the recovery from the pandemic. Similarly, just as justice problems are on the rise, um, there are many key barriers um, to access to justice that we already know are being exacerbated by the pandemic. So prior to the pandemic, about um, fewer than a third accessed any form of help to deal with their problems. About one in six people gave up trying to resolve their problems. Approximately the same proportion reported that it was um, difficult or nearly impossible to find the money they needed to resolve their problem. More than a quarter reported um, a negative physical or health, um, physical or stress-related health impact, and um, about more about one in five reported economic hardship as a result of their legal problem. Now we already know that um, many institutions are closed, dealing with backlogs and reduced staff as a result of the pandemic, and also there's large economic fallout as a result of the pandemic. So these justice barriers um, will only likely increase and we need to keep an eye on these. Lastly, um, it's important to talk about the relationship between poverty and inequality of experience. So this shows data from our legal needs survey and it shows the um, incidence of um, problems experienced by those who receive government assistance and from those who do not. And in every country, we see that recipients of government assistance are more likely to experience justice problems than those who are not. And that we see a similar trend for people who are unemployed, for people with long-term health problems or disabilities, victims of crime, and other marginalized groups. Um, we also know that poverty has been rising as a result of the pandemic. The World Bank estimates that an additional 120 million people have fallen into extreme poverty in the last year, and the ILO estimates that 225 million job, full-time jobs have been lost in the last year, and this is four times the rate of job loss um, as compared to the 2009 financial crisis. So because we know that this relationship exists, we know that there will be rising poverty and inequality of justice experience. Um, so this is something that policymakers will really need to address in the coming years. 
So data challenges and opportunities. Um, before I delve into the specific data challenges and opportunities, I want to talk a little bit about the role of data in realizing SDG 16. I realize this might be kind of preaching to the choir, given um, the panelists who will be speaking today and the, probably the profile of those who are interested in this topic. But it's important to touch on this because many policymakers might not see um, the importance of investing in data at a time when there are many um, urgent demands on resources. So I just kind of want to take a, a, a second to talk about this, too, because we can't just assume that everybody realizes the role of, um, of data. So one is that data is important for making the case for investing in rule of law and access to justice. Data can show us um, and quantify the cost of weak rule of law or poor access to justice um, and also quantify the benefits of investing in both. It can also provide a diagnostic for appropriate justice services and policies. Um, without data, policymakers might not be um, investing in justice services that have the greatest impact, or they might not be targeting justice problems that have the greatest cost to people and society. Data is also a mechanism for building trust and accountability. Um, Trust, public trust in institutions was already deteriorating prior to the pandemic and in many cases has only gotten worse as a result of some countries' response to the pandemic. Um, and data that is open, accessible, and well communicated can help build public trust um, and help communicate that um, officials are making good on their commitments. Also, data is important for ensuring that no one is left behind. Without data on the needs and experiences of marginalized groups, we really can't assess to what extent um, the countries and the global community are delivering on the promise of leaving no one behind. So what are some of the challenges of the data ecosystem? One is an over-reliance on administrative data from institutions. Many people don't turn to formal institutions to resolve their justice problems. Um, in addition, um, right now, many institutions are partially closed, have limited staff, um, and so their ability to, um, you know, engage in data collection efforts might be even more constrained than prior to the pandemic. And in addition, people might not be turning to formal institutions to resolve their problems or turning to institutions at all. This can be addressed by um, turning to surveys such as crime victimization surveys and legal needs surveys. However, these are expensive and infrequently used. In addition, they um, often rely on face-to-face -face interviews, which have been difficult, if not impossible, during periods of the pandemic. Um, in the case of justice, there's many different um, institutions that are collecting and using data from statistics agencies, judiciary, civil society organizations, administrative agencies, and there's oftentimes a lack of coordination among them, lack of information sharing, lack of agreement on key metrics and definitions. There's also limited capacity to collect and use justice data. This is in part due to uh, human and financial resources, but also many decision makers might not seek out data or might not have the expertise to make the most of the justice data that is available to inform their decision making. And lastly, there's an under, underdeveloped culture of monitoring, evaluation, and learning in the justice sector. Um, we're far behind other social sectors, such as, a, uh, such as education and health, when it comes to monitoring, evaluation, and learning. And as many of you are probably already aware, this was one of the obstacles to getting SDG 16 and Target 16.3 even included in the Sustainable Development Agenda in the first place. Sarah, so you have another we... minute. Another sure. minute. Go on. So how do we grapple with all of this? Um, this year, the World Justice Project and Pathfinders released, it, released a justice data challenge paper with three key priorities um, to advance, um, advance just, people-centered justice data. These priorities focus on understanding the scope, nature, and impact of justice problems, designing and delivering people-centered justice services, measuring what works, then learning and adapting. There were several sub-priorities within each of these, so I'd invite you to review the paper. Um, but three key themes uh, that cut across all of these priority areas were a focus on partnerships, so partnerships between official and non-official data producers, as well as partnerships with other social sectors, a focus on innovation, so again, using non-official data, but also a fit, um, innovative data collection um, strategies and uh, service delivery model models. And then also there's a focus on people centricity. So putting people at the center of the data we're collecting um, and the services, just the services that are being delivered. Um, so with that, um, I will end my presentation and look forward to the discussion. 
Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Uh, that is quite uh, impressive. Um, I want just to recall that um, uh, target 16.3.3, access to civil justice, has been, as you said, incorporated uh, in the uh, indicators, uh, uh, thanks also to an advocacy that you spearheaded with other organizations, and we are very happy to measure that. Uh, and to have data today on that, uh, based on, on perceptions. So the next uh, speaker is uh, Toby Mendel, Executive Director of the Center for Law and Democracy. Uh, so Toby, you have the floor. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I should uh, uh, mention in advance that I have a cold. So if I cough during the presentation, you know, it's, it's not because of COVID. I actually have a, had a COVID test a couple of days ago. So you don't need to worry on that front. Uh, so I'm the chair of the, I'm the director of the Center for Law and Democracy. Uh, we're a human rights organization which focuses on foundational rights for democracy, of which access to information, which I'll mainly be talking about today, is one of our main themes. Um, and I'm also, I have a another hat, which is that I'm the chair of FOIANet, Freedom of Information Advocates Network, which is the large, but by far the largest civil society network of access to information activists globally. So that's the main mobilizing network for civil society in this space. So I will be focusing on uh, SDG indicator 1610.2, uh, which talks about the adoption and implementation of laws giving individuals a right to access information held by public bodies, uh, which I will call the right to information, which is the emerging modern term for that, uh, that right. Um, now, the right to information has been recognized as a human right under international law, so it has its own direct benefits, uh, but it also brings a wide range of external social, political, economic uh, benefits. Um, for example, it's been widely recognized as an important antidote to corruption. Um, for today, I'd like to focus on two of those benefits, which I think are very relevant to our conversation. Uh, and the first is the enabling role of access to information in relationship to other SDGs. Uh, and it's been widely recognized that the right to information and openness in general, so the right to information gives you a right to access information held by public bodies, but public bodies uh, are open in other ways as well, um, uh, not just, you know, through that law. Uh, but the right to information improves uh, uh, development, I would say, in every sector. I know that's a bold uh, claim, but I think it's it's true. Um, uh, and, and, and for some key structural reasons. Uh, for First of all, the right to information facilitates participation. Uh, by accessing information, people can participate in much more profound and real ways. Uh, it leads, uh, partly through that participation, it leads to a much greater sense of ownership over development initiatives. Uh, and ownership over de uh, development initiatives is really a crucial to their success. Uh, if government just delivers development to the people, uh, that's that's one model which has never been successful. And ownership is a much, a much more important way to do that. Um, and uh, it, it also promotes a lot greater accountability in government uh, so that governments must actually pursue their promises in the development space. Uh, so I think in that way, uh, the right to information improves outcomes uh, across all development areas, whether it's in the area of environment, women's equality, health, basic livelihoods, or anything else. So it's really a, a, a core enabler uh, of, of the other SDGs. And I should mention that while I'm talking about the right to information under 1610.2, uh, the companion uh, right under 1610.2, 1610.1, sorry, uh, the right to freedom of expression also plays a similar enabling role. Uh, it allows people to participate, it holds government's account. Uh, so that's also a companion sort of, sort of right. Uh, and the second issue uh, that I think the right to information is very important uh, for is building trust. Even before COVID, uh, I think the world in general, not every country, but by and large, was at an all-time low in terms of the level of trust between government and people. Uh, there, that, that, that was you know, a crisis already, um, and uh, COVID has really dealt that uh, issue a body blow. Uh, that's partly because of the role of dis and misinformation, uh, and I think everyone on this uh, uh, conference will be aware of that, the impact of that, so I won't spend time on that. Uh, but I think there's another 
slightly more subtle but no less important uh, uh, factor that's played a role here. Uh, and that's, I, I think that even decent governments, uh, and I would put my own government, the government of Canada, uh, into that category, uh, were, I would say, economical with the truth during COVID. They told us from the beginning that they were applying and following the science, and they were doing that. But most governments, or at least good governments, let's say. Not, not all governments, of course, uh, <clears throat> unfortunately. Uh, but what they didn't tell us was that the science was incredibly emergent and underdeveloped and unreliable, especially at the beginning. We didn't know anything about this pandemic. Uh, we were uh, being told to accept massive, un unprecedented restrictions on our fundamental rights, especially the right to movement, but other rights as well, in the name of this pandemic. Uh, by and large, citizens went along with that, uh, but the claims on behalf of science were too strong. Uh, governments didn't say to us, look, we don't really know what we're doing, but we're doing our best. That would have been true. Uh, what they said instead was, we're following the science. Please just believe us. Uh, so I think that that has really um, eroded trust in government uh, in, 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 in really profound ways. Uh, and again, I think that openness is an absolutely essential part of the antidote to that, part of the solution. Um, and I would just give one example. Uh, in most countries, uh, we know uh, what vaccines our, our governments have, have, have bought, um, uh, what kinds, and even maybe how many of them. Uh, but what we rarely know, most countries have not published the contracts for those vaccines. So we don't know, for example, how much they cost. Uh, uh, what the uh, delivery expectations are, other crucial information, which in terms of accountability, in terms of our ability to rely on the delivery of vaccines, all sorts of uh, issues which are of the greatest importance to us these days uh, are still hidden to us. So I think the governments really have to step up to the plate in terms of openness. Uh, moving now to the SDGs, uh, and I mentioned before, uh, for 16.10.2, there are two elements, the adoption and implementation of right to information laws. My own organization has developed what we call the RTI rating, uh, and it's a comprehensive assessment of the legal framework for the right to information in every country which has adopted a right to information law that currently, uh, well, we have 128 countries on the RTA rating out of 129 that have adopted those laws. The RTI rating not only tells us whether a country has adopted a law, uh, but it goes in great detail into how strong that law is and also the precise features of that law. Uh, does it have a quick timeline for responding to requests? Uh, do you have to pay uh, to make a request? What are these exceptions? Are they in line with international standards, et cetera, et cetera? So it's a very powerful tool for assessing the legal framework. When it comes to implementation, however, the matter is much, much more complicated. And the core complexity here derives from the fact that the primary obligation holders under RTI laws are individual public bodies, the Ministry of Health, uh, the Central Bank, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Armed Forces. And in any country, there are hundreds, perhaps thousands of these bodies. So tracking uh, their delivery of this SDG is enormously complicated. In the best cases, each public authority reports on its own performance in this area to a central authority. That a central authority integrates all of that data and publishes a central report. So we can see, for example, how many requests for information were made in the country, uh, how many were answered, how long it took, uh, detailed information like that. So that's the ideal approach. How, and that's an official approach. Uh, unfortunately, in the vast majority of countries, that doesn't happen. In many countries, no such reporting takes place at all. Uh, and in almost every country, many of the public authorities don't report under that. So uh, it's really essential that we have parallel systems of data collection, whether they're official or quasi-official or run by civil society organizations. And there are three uh, main such central tools. Uh, UNESCO, and Jayco is going to speak after me, uh, UNESCO runs one uh, for 2021. Uh, they have a survey which is answered uh, by uh, a, a public authority, by the lead public authority uh, in, in the country. It has eight questions. Um, only three of those questions, though, focus on implementation. So it's a very, uh, I, I would say, 
limited uh, probe into the quality of implementation of these laws, which is really our challenge area. And the other five, uh, and I will let uh, Jaco disagree if he, if he will, but uh, the other five, I think, are already completely answered by the RTI rating because they look at the legal framework and we already know everything about the legal framework in every country through the RTI rating. Um, secondly, there's a, a FOIA net, the civil society network. It has developed a simple methodology for civil society organizations to apply. Um, it's simple, but it's quite a lot more detailed than the US UNESCO methodology. And since 2018, uh, different civil society organizations in different countries have been applying that, uh, often repeat, re repeatedly. So for example, my organization organization applies it every year uh, in Canada. And then finally, uh, my own organization, the Center for Law and Democracy, has developed quite a sophisticated methodology uh, for assessing uh, the, the implementation. Uh, that can be applied either by civil society organizations or by the Central Information Commission, the oversight body uh, for this right. Um, uh, and uh, I would say that that provides the most sophisticated assessment of implementation. Uh, it's quite an in-depth, deep dive methodology. Uh, we have only applied it or completed the application in a couple of countries. We have a number of countries uh, that are ongoing. Uh, and uh, just to give you a sense of the quality of that, uh, we're just starting to apply that in Vietnam. Uh, the Vietnamese government is officially required under its own access to information law to evaluate the law at the three-year point. It is, a pro it is in the three-year point this year, uh, and it has already unofficially approached us and sort of said, well, we're really looking forward to your data because we know that's the best data that's going to be out there. Uh, so I think it really highlights the importance of parallel data. And I would say in this area, the parallel civil society data is the best data. Um, uh, coming now to COVID, and I know I'm getting you to You have only to the, one minute left. Uh, only one minute. one minute. Okay, so just a few quick points about COVID. I mean, basically, um, this issue, we were doing pretty well globally on this issue pre-COVID. Uh, every year, countries were adopting laws. Uh, implementation was a challenge, but at least it was moving forward. Uh, COVID has dealt a, a body blow to that. For example, 2020 was the first year in 30 years that no single country adopted an RTI law. No new countries at all in 2020. Many countries just stopped applying uh, these uh, uh, laws altogether. They just stopped responding to requests, just didn't do it. Um, uh, and I would say all three methodologies were seriously impacted um, by COVID. It was much more difficult to run those methodologies. Jacob may talk a little bit about the, the experience of UNESCO in that respect. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and I would, I would just like to end up with a few recommendations. Um, uh, firstly, uh, I would call on UNESCO, and I think I speak for most civil society organizations. We really appreciate the excellent work that UNESCO is doing, but we feel it should be significantly more ambitious in its methodology. Uh, the eight question survey uh, is great, but it, it needs to be more in depth. We applied the UNESCO methodology in 2019. I can't remember exactly how many questions it had then, but quite a lot more than that. Um, uh, secondly, we call on states, of course, to continue to adopt and uh, implement the access to information laws. And also from an SDG DI in a point of view, uh, we, we call on them to be much more open to incorporating civil society data into their formal reporting. Uh, only a few countries have shown a, a good openness towards that. <clears throat> Not only to blame others, but I would say civil society also needs to take on a little bit of responsibility here. Uh, we need more civil society organizations to be doing these parallel assessments, that we need them to be done in 30, 40, 50, 60 countries, not just the, the dozen or so that, that is taking uh, place in. And finally, I would call on donors to allocate far more money to this area. Um, I, I, I'm conscious of what Sarah said, that everybody's economy is strapped at the moment and that people are overspent, uh, but there is really a, a very, very limited amount of funding. Most of the civil society assessments that are taking place are, are done voluntarily, and I think that we really need to have uh, more support from the donor community on that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Toby. Uh, you brought into this conversation a, a very interesting and I, I would say spicy uh, argument on uh, uh, integrating uh, official and non-official data. And we have an opportunity here with the next uh, speaker, who is uh, Jaco Dutoit, uh, Chief of uh, Universal Access to Information Section at the Communication and Information Sector in uh, UNESCO. 
to uh, talk about uh, uh, the point of view from uh, the guardian of an official indicator. So, Jaco, you have the floor. Thank you so much, um, and uh, thank you, Toby, I think, also for introducing um, this subject as we take a specific look at uh, SDG 16.10.2, which is on, on access to information. Now, um, UNESCO is the UN custodian agency for uh, the specific uh, indicator. And the reason why we want to, um, to, to collect uh, the, the information is that um, we would like to, to see how we can improve policies and practices uh, of access to information. Now, as uh, Toby said, um, this indicator looks specifically at, um, at the questions related to the adoption and the Im implementation of access to information provisions. And we have eight questions. These eight questions um, are uh, related to specific principles of access to information uh, so that we could measure at least um, what is being done in terms of its implementation um, as it relates to specifically oversight mechanisms, appeals mechanisms, records keeping and reporting, and then finally the limited scope um, of exemptions. Now we, um, as Toby said, we used to have a much more complex um, uh, mechanism of 23 uh, um, questions, but we had to reduce it as, as this questionnaire was pri uh, primarily destined for information commissioners, uh, the data protection and privacy commissioners, the human rights commissions or, or ombudsman. So um, we, um, when we consulted um, these uh, data holders, they also indicated the kind of data that they can directly and within the time frame through a questionnaire actually uh, answer. So um, that is um, a, a little bit um, the background uh, in terms of, of the, this uh, SDG. If we go to, um, to um, the, the countries that have uh, access to information guarantees, um, I think that um, uh, I think Toby mentioned already 127 countries. Um, for, uh, in 1990, there were only 14 countries. So there's definitely an increase in terms of these, um, these guarantees and its existence. But in terms of implementation, we also have to look what that uh, definitely means. Now, um, in our survey, um, we had uh, only 69 countries that that responded uh, with data uh, on um, on uh, and 89% um, of them uh, actually did have constitutional statutory or policy guarantees on access to information. Um, we concentrated also very much on uh, the existence of, of oversight bodies. And um, I think they, uh, what is also important that there's a variety of oversight bodies, as I mentioned earlier, and that makes it very difficult actually to report uh, from their perspective on the activities, on the relationship with the executive and, and other bodies of, of um, of the state, um, et cetera, and, and, and finding, I think, also a very um, universal way of reporting on this uh, with comparative data is something that is not easy, uh, at least within um, um, this specific um, uh, field. Uh, when we asked um, questions as it relates to disclosure and refusal of information, only a few countries responded um, uh, and provided data on the specific um, elements. So uh, countries seem not all of the world, not all countries seem to actually collect this data. And I think this highlights the importance also of um, record keeping within um, these specific institutions and government as um, um, in a whole when it comes to, um, to uh, public um, information. Now, um, 
if we um, if we look specifically at uh, keeping the promise on access to information, um, especially during the times of COVID. So uh, Toby already mentioned uh, this um, in the last few uh, the last year in terms of COVID, no new laws were adapted. There were definitely infringements in terms of access to information laws because people did not adhere to the uh, three-part um, uh, uh, test uh, that looks at um, uh, how uh, access to information is provided by law, how it protects uh, legit legitimate interests, and how it protects um, uh, um, also um, the necessity to protect legitimate uh, interests. So we have we had uh, several of these cases, but I think it's also important to mention that uh, during this time, there were also some good examples of countries that used ICTs in order to release more information in accessible formats in different uh, languages, etc. So um, if we, um, the COVID definitely impacted um, the ability of countries um, to uh, implement their access to information laws. Um, and um, But I think that um, what is also important is that um, when we reach out in collecting the data from these dif different partners that you can see on the screen, um, uh, they were definitely hampered by um, the fact that not all of the time they were actually um, in um, in contact with those that uh, that keep the data um, uh, in terms of of access to information. Toby mentioned earlier that in some countries there could be thousands of these um, um, government institutions um, that look specifically at at access to information. So, uh, COVID definitely uh, hampered the the whole process. Um, also in terms of reaching out to uh, the institutions, um, in terms of uh, obtaining the, the right information, there was definitely an impact in terms of um, this uh, field. Now, um, when we look at the question of access to information, and specifically the element that was raised on on official data and, and, and non-official data, I think um, we see a definitely a multi-stakeholder approach when we look at uh, the question of access to information, where UNESCO definitely targets oversight bodies specifically as a coordination body that, um, that provides us with um, access to information uh, information but um, that we also feel that needs to be um, uh, enhanced in its role in coordinating access to information among the different um, public institutions. But we also see, of course, um, a role of, of civil society uh, where uh, institutions like Toby's institution then have very specialized and deep information that is being produced in terms of um, the implementation of access to information laws. UNESCO also um, supports um, at the same time uh, some of uh, the civil society organizations that want to produce shadow reports on access to information. And all of these different information sources actually advocate for the importance of access to information um, within uh, the different uh, countries. We also uh, work very closely with um, international networks that promote the questions of access to information. So um, specifically the professional bodies like um, the ICIC or uh, RTA that, um, that definitely play a role in order to find a space for um, information commissioners within the scope of what um, good governance actually means. I'll uh, maybe stop there and I'm more than happy to uh, for any questions that you might have. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Jaco. And as uh, you said, uh, this is a really a request to the audience. If anybody has any uh, question uh, that we'd like to pose to the panel, you may start uh, uh, using the chat function to post your questions. 
uh, and then we uh, can proceed uh, with uh, uh, the interactive session to provide feedback to you. The next uh, speaker uh, is Roberto Kukushka, is a research coordinator at Transparency International. Roberto, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me and I'm also about to share my screen. So I hope that works. Um, see. So everyone should be able to see my screen by now, correct? Perfect. Um, well, I'm going to be focusing here on uh, the work that Transparency International has been doing on measuring mostly uh, the indicator on uh, corruption. So that would be 16.5, so bribery and um, corruption. As you may know, we produce um, several uh, indicators and data uh, points that have to do with this. Um, and before starting, I think it's important to give a little bit of an overview of what we have been up to over the past um, year and a half, so to speak. Last time, last time that we spoke, I think we had only um, finalized our uh, corruption survey in Latin America, and a lot has happened since then. Uh, one of the first things that we did when COVID um, happened or appeared was um, come up with a bit of a, like a thought experiment uh, that would help us explain to the world why uh, even though the focus of, um, you know, everybody would likely be on COVID and the pandemic itself, it was also important to keep an eye on corruption. So very similar to uh, what Sarah explained on rule of law and what was being also said about freedom of uh, freedom and access to information. Um, I think um, what we did was precisely try to explain what are the interlinkages that um, make corruption an important thing to fight in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and we came up with um, like this uh, report that you can find on our website. It's called Getting Ahead of the Curve. And it looks at how we foresee uh, corruption and COVID interacting with uh, different elements. So with civil and political rights, different checks and balances in, um, for, for governments, state capacity, the economy, inequality, um, social cohesion and trust that was also already mentioned today as a, as a big issue. Um, the information landscape, we also went into um, analyzing what could be the, um, the impact of this for big tech companies and also for illicit financial flows, and then an overall assessment of um, what this could mean for international affairs. So there was, this was more of like a thought um, piece, so to speak, um, to you know, bring attention of why uh, corruption is important, but also why the data that we have been producing for years is important to be looked at in the current context um, because I think it could explain a lot. So um, moving on, um, I think as we start every year um, at Transparency International with the launch of the CPI, uh, one of the things that we did this year was again to bring attention to the issue of COVID and how corruption uh, matters here was to uh, triangulate the corruption data that we produce through the Corruption Perceptions Index uh, with some of the COVID statistics that we were seeing. And in this case, we took data from uh, the Varieties of Democracy uh, data, uh, or data set, um, where they, they counted basically those countries where the response to the pandemic had registered no major violations, for example, uh, to, the, um, um, to democratic standards. Um, and they registered also those who had minor, some, or major violations. And what we saw is that, as expected, and I think as Sarah was already mentioning earlier as well, uh, those countries where we have low levels of corruption were the ones where we saw the least violations to um, democratic standards um, in the response to the emergency, which also comes to show that um, fighting corruption is important not only in the times of a pandemic, and that's also something that we saw. We saw an increase of people coming to us and say, hey, uh, even donors, for example, saying, hey, Transparency International, uh, COVID is happening. Uh, there is now a need to channel funds to developing countries. How do we keep those funds? How we do, do we protect that from falling into the wrong hands? Um, and I think at the time, part of the, uh, the answer that we kept giving was, well, you know, this is why you need to put up these systems uh, before the pandemic hits and before any emergency comes. Because once the emergency, emergency happens, then um, 
without all of the necessary checks and balances and all of the constraints that you need to prevent corruption, um, it is more likely that what the aid that you're allocating will be much more or less effective. So um, this is what we try to use the, the Corruption Perceptions Index to draw awareness to. Um, and at the same time, we have also been producing our, so to speak, primary data, which is our survey data on, on uh, perceptions, attitudes, and experiences of corruption um, through our Global Corruption Barometer, which now has a more regional approach. So since we spoke in 2020 about the uh, results in Latin America, we have finalized um, the GCB in the Middle East and North Africa region, uh, the GCB in Asia, which was published also in 20, uh, late 2020. And we now have just finalized the field work. I mean, if we finalize the field work in, in December for the GCB EU, which will cover the 27 countries of the European Union at the national, but also some of them at the subnational level. So we have this time bigger samples to be able to also uh, analyze the data at the subnational level. Um, and we're also conducting a survey in the Pacific. Both of these, the last two, were meant to be done um, by last year. But of course, due to COVID and one issue that Sarah already mentioned as well, um, um, we had to delay the process. So um, in order, and one of the challenges that we've been facing is that uh, in many of the countries that we wanted to cover, the ideal methodology to gather data was, of course, with face-to-face -face surveys which was made impossible by COVID. So we could not um, um, send people to Asia, for example, to like the 17 Asian countries that we covered, uh, asking face-to-face -face questionnaires. So we were limited to then a sample of countries where uh, phone coverage was um, um, good enough to, to do a phone survey. Uh, same was the situation in the EU. Fortunately, in the EU, phone penetration is good enough to conduct this sort of exercise over the phone. Um, and the Pacific has been a real, real challenge. And we have now come to accept that uh, the results that we will obtain from this uh, study will be, um, you know, might not be nationally representative, but will be biased towards the urban and um, richer population because of uh, the methodological choice. So we're aware of this, um, but we still thought that it was important to, um, to conduct the exercise. Um, and then in terms of how we see the world going after COVID hit, uh, I think it's important to say here that um, the progress in, you know, the fight against corruption and controlling corruption, according to many of the measurements that we have, um, is actually going at a glacial pace, not really advancing very much. So it's difficult to say that COVID came and, uh, and slowed it even further. So we were already seeing very little progress. And uh, I think COVID might have reverted what we see in some places, but uh, when we look, for example, at the data that we obtained from the Corruption Perceptions Index since 2012 until now, we only see 26 countries where the scores have improved significantly and another 22 where the scores have declined. And if we triangulate then this with some of the um, data that we have from the Global Corruption Barometer, I think many of these trends um, get actually um, supported by the data that we get from citizens as well. Um, in terms of, uh, well, I guess uh, well, the, the indicator that is most aligned with what we're measuring as, as well for the SDGs is the one on bribery. And the latest that we have, the latest survey that we had, um, well, the two, two more are coming, but the one that we just concluded was Asia in November uh, 2019. So that one is already published. And we see again, sort of a mixed bag in terms of where bribery rates are going. In some countries, we saw an important decline. So in countries like India, Myanmar, Malaysia, and Thailand and Vietnam, between 2016 and the data that we have now, we saw important declines. In other countries, we just saw mostly the same numbers that we had uh, five years ago. So in Cambodia, China, Indonesia, Mongolia, and Sri Lanka, it was more or less the same. And we saw the bribery rates go up surprisingly in countries like South Korea and Taiwan which also shows that, I mean, even when focusing in this very narrow understanding of corruption as bribery, um, the more developed countries should not just um, stop paying attention to the problem of corruption. And another thing that we have trying to be, we, we are now doing uh, with the GCB data is to go beyond this narrow understanding of, of corruption as bribery in many countries. So um, there's a lot of criticism, for example, on 
why sometimes um, perception-based indicators or such as a CPI does not, do not really measure uh, or do not really coincide with the data that we see on bribery. And one of the responses to that is that we believe that citizens have mo many more um, tools to assess the level of corruption in the country than just the experience of bribery. So one of the uh, questions that we have now is also the use of personal connections to, uh, to access or to obtain a service. So it's not only that sometimes you have to pay to get a service, but sometimes you also see people that, you know, jump the line or get something they're not entitled to by pulling strings, so to speak. So that's also now a question that we're including as a staple in all, in all of our um, uh, surveys. And it proved to be actually quite high in Asia. And um, I mean, we are now only analyzing the results for Europe, but I can already give you a bit of um, a, a teaser, so to speak that there are some very surprising results across the European Union as well, which also shows that, you know, the problem of corruption is not fully solved um, here either. Um, and to, finally, another, just look- Another minute, yes. Perfect. Thank you. I, that's all I need. Um, in terms of uh, challenges and opportunities, I think many of them, and I promise I did not copy this from Sarah or the previous speakers either. Um, I think so the challenges that we face, I already mentioned, uh, the methodological choices that are limited, um, the problem of ensuring data quality and um, um, keep, yeah, ensuring data quality when you cannot really do the most robust methodology that you can have. Um, another problem that we're facing is how to ensure the sustainability of such surveys, uh, since, as it was already mentioned, there is not a lot of money now to do this. There's a lot of demand for victimization data and for this type of data, but not a lot of support. And uh, in terms of challenges, uh, uh, sorry, opportunities, I think uh, it is time for more organizations to build alliances and work together uh, to address the data challenge. Um, I think the world has seen more and more the importance of having good and reliable data to inform um, the policy design and decision making. And finally, I think we're also now starting to see how uh, there is this more multidimensional thinking. So. Um, how we're now starting to see more as well the interlinkages between different sources of data and how, uh, you know, corruption might be related to rule of law. It's also, of course, important to bring in um, the freedom of information uh, in indicators and so on. So I think creating these more, um, these stories with more sources of data would be really important moving forward. And I will just leave it at that and happy for any questions that may come. Thanks a lot, uh, Roberto. Uh, very interesting and impressive. Also, the uh, interlinkages across the various presentations. We'll come back to uh, that uh, in the closing uh, debate. And now uh, we are going to listen to our last uh, speaker, uh, my colleague and friend, Alberto Fernandez Kibaja, Senior Program Officer at International IDEA. Alberto, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Massimo, um, and I will try to be brief as the last speaker. Um, so I will start by sharing my presentation. Uh, so I'm going to try to uh, walk you through a little bit um, how we are uh, measuring uh, democracy and to a larger extent governance um, in different countries and how that monitoring uh, is helpful for the SDG 16 monitoring and also a little bit to know uh, how we are seeing the pandemic affecting uh, many of the indicators that that we um, that we consider so very briefly just a very important element of our measurement and that's why it is pretty comprehensive is because we don't understand democracy as just one element but rather an aggregation of different components um, so what you can see here, we see democracy as uh, having five pillars, um, checks on government, fundamental rights, representative government, participatory engagement, and impartial administration. And then each of these pillars have uh, sub pillars that are, um, give you a comprehensive understanding of each of them. Democracy and by, by, by definition also governance is not just elections, it's multidimensional. And, and it looks different in every country. Um, but it's also important to, to understand that uh, democracies still share certain elements that are common to them. 
based on this understanding, what we do is that we find different databases that gather all this information for each of the elements. Um, we use a lot of the information that has been presented here today. Um, and we use um, uh, data from other organizations like um, Political Terror Scale, Polity4, um, the Lexical Index of Electoral Democracy, Varieties of Democracy, uh, UN data. So we cross both official and unofficial data uh, in order to get a measurement of all this. Uh, just a little bit of the technicalities. We weight everything uh, and, and we provide the scores to all of these attributes from zero to one. What we get? We get this picture. Uh, I choose randomly one country, this, this is Sri Lanka, and we get a comprehensive picture of all of these different elements of so clean elections, elected government, free political parties, et cetera, et cetera. We get a classification also, are they performing high, mid-level, uh, mid-range or low? And we can compare, and, and, and that's very important at the country level, but also uh, at the global level. Um, if, if you look at how we understand democracy, there are um, eight SDGs. There are, I mean, almost all of them, but um, more in detail, eight SDGs are included in our measurement of democracy. Obviously, uh, SDG 16 is the one that we measure more comprehensively. And, it is included, um, we have measurements of, um, of all these subcomponents of SDG 16, 1, 3, 5, 6, 7, and 10, um, especially 6 and 7. But um, we, we have measures of, of all these. So by looking at our indices, uh, we can get a pretty good understanding on, on how um, countries and regions are, are moving in the implementation of, of um, SDG 16. Um, 16.7, the ensure responsible, inclusive, participatory, and representative decision making at all levels is definitely the one that will encompass better um, what we are trying to measure and, and the results that we get. So, what was the situation before the pandemic? Um, and and, and this is important to understand also where are we heading now and, and what type of information we might be needing uh, in the future. Before the pandemic, um, we saw a very uneven geographical evolution of, um, of, of SDG 16. Africa and the Middle East were the ones making the most progress. Um, this is also a consequence of them starting for a very low um, point in, in many aspects. Um, and even if they were doing the most progress, they still need to catch up, especially in 16.6. Um, there are a lot of space for them to, to get to the average uh, global level in, in, in most of our indicators. Latin America and the Caribbean and North America have since significant challenges in combat combating uh, corruption, reducing violence, and on fundamental freedoms. Um, this is something that um, will come as a surprise and that is holding uh, this region behind in many aspects. Um, in the case of Europe, we have seen declines, uh, also the scores, I mean, uh, were relatively higher. So Europe, even though they are closer to achieve most of the um, elements on, on SDG 16, they are still um, moving not in the right direction, moving in the wrong direction. Um, and Asia and the Pacific has has um, has made many many uh, significant advances, made many significant advances before the pandemic. Uh, a lot of challenges remain on civil liberties, and then um, the pandemic came. And, and to a certain extent, we are still trying to understand what has been, what is going to be the impact. Um, but we are seeing a, uh, a few trends that are, are important to highlight. As um, one of my co um, speakers said, the trust in key governance institution is declining uh, globally. This will affect uh, growing executive, this will create growing executive overreach, uh, growing mistrust, mistrust of political parties and other key actors that are fundamental for democracy. 
and seemingly an increasing power of liberal forces. And we're seeing this all over the world, um, how illiberal forces are uh, capturing the discourse and are, are getting more and more uh, um, um, vocal of their, of their proposals. Access to justice has stagnated um, globally because of the pandemic, and it might take many years to recover. And this is uh, something that it will be a challenge to measure. Gender equality, um, especially at decision making, um, remains far from, from achieved, and inequalities are threatening the sustainability of democracy, uh, which is coupled with uh, persistent corruption. There are probably two sides of the same coin. Um, shrinking civic space, we was already mentioned, uh, especially freedom of expression is also uh, taking a significant um, hit. After observing the pandemic uh, for a year and a half almost, um, this is what we can add to this picture. And we have measured 64% of countries have implemented concerning measures, and concerning measures are measures that are uh, either undemocratic, that are not uh, necessary, not proportional, or not legal within the um, legal system of, of the countries. These measures have, um, have had a negative impact on democracy and human rights, and, human rights. and, and they, might, they, they have to be addressed in the, in the near future. 54% of countries have restricted freedom of expression and media integrity. This is probably the most worrisome development. Uh, this is something that we have seen all over, especially in non-democratic regimes. And, and, and it will, many of the laws that have been passed are not uh, temporal, but permanent laws that have been passed in the midst of, of the pandemic, usually under states of emergency. Um, 85 countries, uh, of the 166 that we are measuring have made an excessive use of uh, force while implementing measures. And this is also uh, a worrying trend because it is, um, it is it's going to be difficult to measure this. Um, to finalize with some very, some relatively positive notes, um, we have seen how the pandemic has also created um, more participatory institutions uh, in certain countries, especially those who have managed the pandemic better. And rule of law, when it was strong, it has withstand the crisis. This is difficult to measure. It's difficult to understand, to, to measure this, either with official or with unofficial data. But we have seen that the rule of countries with a strong rule of law system are the ones who have been able to, um, uh, to withstand better the crisis. Complementing what was said in the first in the first presentation, um, something that will also be a challenge in the future uh, in terms of measurement is also the increasing importance of certain social aspects, uh, health, which is related with SDG three, um, more inclusive human settlements, uh, SDG eleven, um, and in some cases, and it's something that it's probably we need to also understand how to measure is um, more open governments. Uh, we have seen that in New Zealand, Australia, Norway, Uruguay, Taiwan, which all of them happen to be some of the most successful countries in handling the pandemic. Um, so there is also uh, an important factor in how opening governance has, um, has also had a very positive impact in, in the pandemic. And I'm going to stop with that. Sorry for being a bit uh, in a hurry, but I wanted to allow time for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, and uh, uh, thank you also to those who have started to post uh, questions. I see in the chat uh, uh, that uh, there is already a conversation between uh, some uh, uh, participants. Uh, I see uh, in particular the question posed uh, by Maya Sterling uh, to the panelists about uh, what who typically funds this kind of data collection, who would want to fund more of it? And uh, there is also a, another uh, question that is, uh, or a, a remark that is uh, made by Marianne Rickman, uh, that is specifically to Roberto. Uh, thanks for the presentation. And could you please type the link of the presentation in the chat? 
maybe uh, you can do that uh, too, uh, Roberto. Now, uh, I think uh, that we have time for uh, some 15 minutes uh, of exchanges. Uh, those uh, questions were already partially responded by Toby and others in the chat, but we'll get back to the panelists. So let me just uh, make a couple of uh, general comments. The first one is that it is interesting to see the convergence between the different presentations on a number of uh, different issues. This has already been highlighted by the various panelists. Uh, what strikes me in particular is uh, the issue of trust in institution, uh, which is so important for the achievement of the agenda as a whole. Um, many also refer to the difficulty of uh, collecting data uh, from uh, non-official sources, especially when uh, the so-called social distancing or physical distancing uh, is, is a barrier to collecting face-to-face -face information. So uh, this has an impact on the methodology. It may have also impact in terms of the openness of the responders because even uh, in those uh, countries where uh, there is a good phone coverage, which is another major infrastructural barrier uh, as an alternative to face-to-face -face, uh, interviews, uh, there is also the issue of uh, privacy of, uh, you know, the, again, as, as an element that is related to the general issue of trust. Um, another interesting convergent uh, trend is uh, the uh, role of uh, uh, different stakeholders in uh, uh, collecting data from uh, official and non-official sources in order to paint a better big picture of the situation. This is something that uh, some of you already stressed. Uh, for example, uh, the conversation uh, that we heard uh, in uh, the dialogue between uh, Toby and Jaco on uh, uh, data on uh, the adoption of uh, legislation on one hand and data on implementation is something that uh, uh, predates uh, the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And it is uh, uh, what I would call a sort of a systemic issue that needs to be addressed not only on 1610.2, uh, which is the indicator that we're referring to, but actually cuts across all the other presentations and, and also other targets as well. Think uh, uh, of what uh, Sarah said in terms of access to justice uh, and uh, uh, the presentation on uh, corruption by Roberto. Uh, what uh, Alberto told us about uh, uh, overall trends in, uh, in the pandemic uh, environment is also interesting uh, as it affects uh, other SDGs. I think uh, uh, all of the panelists spoke of their particular perspective uh, in the light of uh, the enabling function of SDG 16 uh, from their particular uh, area of uh, work, uh, corruption, access to information, access to justice. Uh, but uh, what Alberto uh, stressed is also that it, it goes well beyond uh, individual targets. Uh, so, a sort of, again, a systemic approach uh, on how SDG 16 uh, is an enabler for the, uh, the whole of the SDGs is important. Uh, let me just uh, refer to uh, the analysis he made about uh, gender equality, which is SDG 16 and in turn SDG 6, uh, 5 uh, as an enabler and an accelerator for the SDGs as a whole on gender equality. So I would like to know whether there are uh, other questions or comments that uh, you may make. You have two options. Uh, one is writing in the chat um, the question and please uh, uh, identify yourself when you write it. Uh, or uh, maybe making a comment, in which case we would uh, uh, give you the floor. Uh, meanwhile, I would uh, get back to the uh, panelists. Uh, maybe they can say something more about the other element that uh, actually cut across all the presentation. That is the need to fund this type of data and what are the main sources of funding? Uh, who wants to come uh, into this? Yes, Toby. So I raised it in my presentation and we've been chatting about it in the chat. Uh, I mean, I think that um, 
it, uh, part of the problem here is that um, you know merely merely assessing uh, isn't quite as sexy as building something new or doing something you know that contributes in a direct way or considered to be a more direct way uh, to a developmental objective. And so um, you know it's it's one thing you know in my area it's one thing to work on getting a country to pass an access to information law. And, you know donors are usually pretty happy to jump in on that if it seems like there's some chance of that happening, but just getting to assess what they did with it afterwards doesn't look sexy enough. So I think we need to have a little bit, I mean, maybe we need, and I think donors need to step up the plate a little bit, understanding that assessment is not uh, an outside feature. It's a core you know, element of uh, the success of these initiatives. You know, you can't just build something and then just leave it there. You need to continuously monitor and evaluate and assess, uh, or you don't know whether what you've done uh, is working. So I think that we need to kind of deepen that understanding uh, a little bit and then perhaps uh, some of the funding will flow and if you will permit me to I, I just uh, I was really interested in Alberto's comments uh, several comments about uh, the, you know declines in, in fundamental freedoms under 1610 and some interesting statistics about that um, and I, I would point to uh, perhaps this is a bit uh, a glib way of putting it but a, a pandemic within a pandemic because what we've seen in the area of freedom of expression so my organization also does a lot of work on freedom of expression uh, and what we've seen in, in the area of freedom of expression, of obviously the digital uh, transformation, which is now uh, no longer a new phenomenon, but a deepening, I guess, and a you know constantly evolving phenomenon. Uh, and in the last five to ten years, uh, in the first, you know, going back before that, we, we saw that pretty much as a positive thing. You know, people were unable to speak. Repressive governments couldn't control them very easily. Uh, you know, it was a huge democratization of the communicative space. But in the last five to 10 years, we've seen a lot of negative impacts as well. The whole mis and disinformation, hate speech, uh, you know, uh, attacks on, on gender equality. I mean, there's a lot of negative uh, impacts on that too. Um, and those are real impacts. And we don't uh, really have a clear framework for how to address those effectively while still respecting fundamental rights and freedoms. And what we've seen in that situation and ex significantly exacerbated during COVID is governments being highly opportunistic and sort of thinking, okay, uh, you know, everybody's concerned about this. I'm going to just jump in with a law that does something. I'm going to ban false news, uh, you know, even though under international law, that's clearly not a legitimate solution. And so we've seen both, you know, uh, governments that are, are genuinely trying to control this and problems and other governments that just want to control freedom of expression as has always been the case. So I think and and, and COVID has somehow uh, by diverting our attention and by somehow making it seem that this problem is much more serious uh, than it had been before has really opened up the opportunity for governments to be opportunistic in this space. So we've seen a lot of negative activity and I would suspect that quite a few of those rollbacks that you mentioned Alberto on, on 1610 uh, relate to digital legislation uh, as opposed to more traditional areas of free speech and that's that's a very contested zone basically thank you toby thank you. and uh, before getting back to roberto maybe uh, let me also read uh, from the chat uh, from stephen buckley a question that uh, has just been posted increased use of video conferencing due to the pandemic seems to have increased the public participation in government decision making this is actually a point that uh, Alberto also made. Has there been anything more than anecdotal evidence? This is from Stephen Buckley, opengovmetrics.com. Yes, Alberto. Um, take, so two things. I'm gonna first take this question uh, and then answer to Toby's comment. Um, I had, I'm not aware of um, anything more than anecdotal evidence. Um, perhaps what it might have happened is that <clears throat> um, some of these uh, deliberative democracy or participatory democracy processes that were already taking place, and it goes from um, the, the Constitution Assemblies in Ireland, uh, the, um, uh, the French uh, climate uh, crisis, um, Citizen Assembly on Climate Crisis, and, and many other examples in for instance, in Latin America, very active in this sense, um, they might have become a bit more accessible or easy to organize because everybody was at home. A lot of people were, had a lot of free time in their hands. 
um, and, and, and they maybe felt um, it was the right moment to do that. Uh, but I haven't seen anything more than anecdotal evidence. Uh, OECD is doing a very good job uh, gathering data for OECD countries, but it's just limited to those countries. So we're missing basically the rest of, of the world. Um, what um, Toby was highlighting, I think, is um, after being for a year monitoring um, the different measures and events related with COVID, um, the aspect that has had more uh, concerning developments is <clears throat> personal security, uh, which is not just difficult, but it's understandable because uh, for the first time in most of our lives, we were restrained at home. We couldn't leave our houses. So it's bound to happen that there is a lot of um, security incidents um, all over the world of people who want to leave their houses and so on. That's kind of like expected. But the pandemic within the pandemic, I actually love that, um, that, that expression. It's, it's very worrisome. And this is related with um, freedom of expression and media integrity, both of them. We have seen three things, as, as you rightly pointed out, um, a lot of countries use the opportunity, ne never let a good crisis uh, go to waste, use the opportunity to pass um, fake news legislation. And we haven't seen a country that has been very successful in that. And that goes from Cambodia to Germany. So all the spectrum of countries uh, that they haven't had very much success in passing legislation that controls the phenomenon, but doesn't attack freedom of expression. Um, a lot of countries have passed different laws. Um, I don't have the number, but we have, we have actually get, gotten that number. So I can um, pass to you. I think we have a list of the countries that have passed uh, this type of legislation during the pandemic. Um, we have seen an extreme increase in prosecution of journalists. Uh, all over the world, like cases from Tanzania withdrawing um, media license to outlets because they were reporting uh, that there actually was a pandemic in Tanzania while the government was denying that. Um, public broadcasting institutions just blindly supporting the strategy of a country, um, which puts into question um, the, the independency of, 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 um, of the broadcasting institution. Um, arrest of journalists for covering um, in hospitals, that type of thing. We have seen an extreme um, increase in that. And the third very worrisome point is um, the control that many countries uh, have done of their information. So uh, many countries play with the data. Uh, they, excuse me, like they, 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 they press the data until they got the right data. Uh, so there is, well, we have seen all over the world how countries have tried to manipulate the data. Um, and and we, are, we have seen more countries that didn't want to show the whole data or that they just took like a couple of weeks to release data just so it looks better, that type of things, than countries that actually open up their data and they were as transparent as possible. Um, some unexpected countries actually were really transparent, like Vietnam or Singapore. Uh, they were really, really open with their data, which is, um, they, they usually don't score very well in this type of uh, measurements, but they were actually very open with the data. And uh, again, if, we, if we're working with this correlation or potential correlation between openness and management of the pandemic, well, both countries were very, very successful in managing the pandemic. Thank you very much, Alberto. Uh, I have... Uh, um... Uh, also a question for, uh, actually from me to Sarah, because I, I found uh, your uh, slides on uh, a broken data uh, ecosystem and uh, the path uh, ahead uh, of very general relevance. What you say the, in, the, in the broken uh, uh, data ecosystem in particular about uh, not only assessment and monitoring, but also evaluation and the use of data for that purpose. Uh, looks to me very important for a forward-looking agenda on uh, building back uh, better. So maybe uh, you could expand a little bit on that and uh, then I will get back also to uh, Jaco and, uh, uh, and to Roberto with uh, another question, please. 
Um, yeah, on the point of, of evaluation and assessment, I, I kind of like how, how Toby framed it just a few moments ago as um, maybe not seeing that as something, you know, apart from, you know, the policy work of delivering on SDG 16, but part of the process. Um, and the OECD has been doing really good um, work on providing, th this is in the context of justice, but I, I think it can apply to other governance areas, um, developing frameworks for, you know, people-centered justice policies. And part of that whole policy design process is using data at the outset as a diagnostic and then at the end um, as an assessment of what works so that you can basically learn and then improve. And it essentially is a continuous um, cycle of learning. So I think part of it is just baking in um, evaluation um, data and, and measurement into um, the policy design process. Um, I think one of the things that um, the WJP team has been researching a lot too is, is trying to understand why in the realm of justice we are so far behind on measurement and evaluation. Um, I think for a long time there were kind of, you know, kind of cultural and ethical concerns um, within the justice space of, well, you know, if you're going to do an impact evaluation, um, that means there's a treatment group and a control group and one group isn't receiving the justice intervention or um, one group is maybe receiving a justice intervention that hasn't been, you know, tr uh, tried. So um, there's been kind of a, a culture, you know, kind of um, kind of that hasn't been working in favor of, of developing these monitoring and evaluation systems. But one thing I think that is really exciting and the path forward is there have been um, more um, assessments and, and cost benefit analyses of um, justice services. So, um, for example, um, the World Bank just released a report um, maybe a year ago on um, cost benefit analyses of legal aid interventions and basically found that in almost every case um, providing legal aid, um, the kind of um, the savings outweighed the cost of, of the program. But I mean, we need we need data to help make this case. So I think to the extent that data can support more effective interventions, um, more savings on, on the part of government, it will help make the case for evaluation and make the case for data um, for more effective um, policy making. And thank you for making that uh, important link between the um, the quality of good data and uh, the quality of, of policies uh, and the responses. Uh, um, maybe Roberto, I may ask you, you refer to challenges and opportunities and uh, among the opportunities, building alliances, good data and the multidimensional thinking. What would uh, you think would be the main recommendations to our audience uh, in order to turn those opportunities into reality? Um, ooh. Well, I think one um, is is what uh, Sarah and Toby have been uh, dis discussing now. I think is reshaping this idea that um, data is just produced for the sake of producing data. Um, I think we need to start seeing data as um, the the foundation and the basis of like good decision making, good policy design, and uh, that money that comes into this is, you know, I, I think it really pays for itself in a way because it really informs. Um, um, what comes next? So for me, that is like one one big uh, one big issue. The second one is that I think we as civil society, speaking from you know the TI side, um, we might need to find ways also to like cut costs by partnering with other organizations because some of these uh, these exercises are quite costly, um, and also need to make uh, use of our data. I think we also have a responsibility to showcase what our data means and to. Um, to link it to then other situations, like to triangulate it with other um, other sources of data as well, to show uh, precisely how the interlinkages work and why it is important to um, to invest in this data and to establish a benchmark to then be able to to um, monitor the policies that we enact. Because um, as the example of the global corruption barometer, uh, we have the funding to conduct one every, I don't know, maybe three, maybe five years, depending on donor and uh, funding and availability. Um, and with that, it's very difficult then to keep an eye on things if you only collect something every every five years. So I think it would be necessary to have um, maybe a conversation as well with the donor community to say, okay, uh, what do you need? How can we support you? And how do we make this sustainable? And I think um, that would be great. And the other um, thing that I, where I, I, I think we need to do more is also increasing the capacity of civil society because not every civil society organization has the capacity to deal with data. 
And I don't think there are enough uh, funding opportunities out there to invest in this area as well. So I think it's easy to say, you know, we need to produce more data and we need to, to have it out there. Um, but to be, to be honest, I know of many civil society organizations that do not have the capacity to either do this, analyze this data or um, do anything meaningful with it. Um, and I think uh, I, those would be my, my recommendations. And I would just quickly, very quickly link that to, to the question that was also posted on uh, funding. Uh, in the, in the, the case of the, of the global corruption barometers, we usually get funding from you know, the big donors. So the Latin America GCB was funded by um, um, Canada Aid, uh, who has like interest in what's going on in Latin America. Then the EU, of course, is funded by the Commission, who is interested in, in doing this. Um, and then the one we have in the Pacific was funded with uh, money from um, Australian aid. So from the Ministry of, of Foreign Affairs in Australia. Um, and what happens here is that then we are left without any funds to cover other countries or other regions that are very, very important for the topics that we want to cover. So this time we didn't manage to cover, you know, the Western Balkans or Central Asia simply because apparently there is no donor interest there right now. So I think um, that's also something that needs to be changed. I mean, we need to be demand driven and see where the funding is. But um, at the same time, I think it is a shame. When, when it goes, um, when, when it happens like, like this. The, the Asia GCB, for example, was fully funded by TI's own um, resources um, because we thought it was very important to invest in this region. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's the reality of the, of the situation. Roberto, you, uh, you made a very important point. It's about sustainability of these uh, uh, provision of information for uh, better policies. Toby would like to respond. We are already three minutes beyond our deadline. So if it is just a very quick uh, response, I'd, I'd like also to give the floor to Jaco before we end. Just very, very quick. I mean, I think, uh, I think Roberto makes a really important point about uh, how a lot of civil society organizations aren't necessarily tooled up to do data analysis. And with the FOIA net methodology that I mentioned for assessing uh, um, the access to information implementation, we develop centrally all of the kind of um, spreadsheets with codes in them with, you know, coded formulas and stuff like that in them. So I think centralizing tools uh, and then, and then, you know, it was designed so that, uh, you know, civil society groups or with limited means all over the place could, could use it. And I think that we can, some of the larger central groups with more capacity can really facilitate work by other groups by hand building tools like that. Thank you, Toby. Very important point. Jaco, uh, I turn uh, to you as uh, the last uh, uh, say, uh, reaction from, uh, from the questions. And uh, you uh, represent a custodian agency. It is very important for us to have you here in this panel. There were many references to building partnerships. You yourself in your presentation made reference to the role of uh, other stakeholders. So what uh, would you see from uh, your point of view as, uh, say, the main recommendations in order to improve this partnership? Thank you very much. Um, I think that um, when we look at the question of um, just positioning data within the um, Agenda 2030, we have to realize that this is an important element for change in countries and i think this is exactly uh, how we should um we should sell the importance of um of collecting data and when we collect this data we cannot do it alone because we will obviously have a skewed um uh, view on the data that we collect this is exactly why unesco is also working with other UN agencies, with civil society organizations, and with governments, which are our main uh, stakeholders. Uh, so I think it's only when somebody also mentioned triangulate these elements that we could um, we could actually move forward. Uh, we um, I think we should also be aware of the importance of um, data collection fatigue. And this is another reason why we should actually work together and not uh, collect the same data, but also have this kind of conversation. Also, where we see the interlinkage between different SDGs uh, and can make use of of uh, each other's data. 
This said, I think uh, we do need to then take uh, the question of open data very seriously so that we could share this data also um, and, 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 um, and compare it. Um, and I think that um, when we invest in the collection of data, it is very important um, that, um, that we also make use of existing mechanisms that uh, that are there. Uh, we've seen several of the, the methodologies that have been um, presented here. We have to make sure that those that are um, the, the data holders are involved in the process so that we have um, uh, we have um, realistic expectations of the quality of the data that we um, that we can collect. And then finally, just to repeat that this data is not an objective in itself, but should make a change uh, in, in people's lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jaco. I want to thank all the panelists and also the participants who uh, posed the questions and interacted on the chat. Uh, my key takeaway from today's meeting is that uh, uh, we had uh, uh, sort of a, a sense of what the next uh, global report of the SDG 16 data initiative might look like, because these analysis is, is going to feed uh, the individual chapters and we'll, uh, we are uh, working already on, on the new global report that will be launched later on this year. Uh, many uh, elements of, uh, say, the, the, the possible opportunities of making the best use of data in uh, building back better, but also an awareness of the challenges that still exist and the importance of building partnerships in order to cope uh, with those challenges. So thanks again to everybody. And on behalf of the SDG 16 Data Initiative, I uh, thank you again for having participated in today's conversation. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.